بالله من شر الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Inshallah, as a continuation for a discussion from yesterday night, in reference to the power, in reference to the ability, and in reference to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instilled from knowledge and application and responsibilities to the Ahlul Bayt, to his hujaj on earth, to his khulafa on earth in which we first and foremost discussed Allah's greatest name and we went into detail about Allah's greatest name as a quick recap we stated that Allah's greatest name consists of 73 letters of which Ibrahim had eight Musa alayhi afdal salati was salam had three Isa had two and we finalized by saying that out of the 73 na- out of the 73 letters of Allah's greatest name, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa had 72, in which then we discussed when looking at Ali ibn Abi Talib and the knowledge that he had, in the reference that we gave yesterday, that we said that Ali ibn Abi Talib also had the 72 letters that the Prophet of Islam had. Now, just to go into detail, first and foremost tonight, we're going to look at the particular verse we stated at the end of yesterday which we want to refer in the Holy Qur'an, who is mentioned that has knowledge from the book? And on the second level, who has knowledge of the book? What's the capabilities of this person that has knowledge from the book? And what are the capabilities of the person that has knowledge of the complete book? Or what can we expect from someone that has the knowledge of the complete book? And we look at it in particular stories, and in reference with the Holy Qur'an, and in reference to the ahadith that we have, and the stories that we learn from. And on the second level, we'd like to look at the idea behind miracles. Because there's a fine line. In the discussion yesterday, there's a fine line between when we believe in the Quran, when we believe in what stories are written in the Quran, wholeheartedly without question. But when it comes towards our prophets, when it comes towards our imams, when miracles are mentioned, even though they do not compare In some aspects, it might be a a minor miracle in comparison to the miracles stated in the Qur'an. Some people may find themselves questioning the fact. Some people may come and say, well, how is it that this particular person has these capabilities? And inshallah, that's the thing we're going to look at on the second level. And on the third level, once we've discussed this, and inshallah we'll continue tomorrow, we want to look at the aspect of bravery, first and foremost, of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because that's the man we're going to be discussing tonight. The bravery of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because there's one thing being brave on a general level. But there's a second level which was Ali ibn Abi Talib. He had bravery with yaqeen. With what we like to refer to as certainty or yaqeen. Much more of an in-depth analogy when we look at the battle of Khandaq. And how this refers to the bravery in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking for. And inshallah we'll conclude with this note. But inshallah we'll start off tonight. So please help me with the reciting aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. In the chapter of the Quran, chapter 27 of the Quran, referred to as the chapter of the ant or namil. In it, it states, when Sulaiman, he refers, and we stated it yesterday, that who can get me the throne of Balqis? 
Let's first and foremost put it into context. I know it's going to be a little bit of a repetition from yesterday because we talked it in a very, very brief manner, but I want to put more emphasis on it so we analyze what kind of power a person that has knowledge from the book has and in reference to the person that has knowledge of the book. So we can put it into context. And this is a story where we can look at the Holy Quran and say to ourselves, this is the most or one of the most extraordinary stories in reference to miracles, if we want to look at it. Because to us, it's out of the norm. It's that much out of normality that it's looked at as a major miracle. But to them, it could be something very normal. Now, Suleiman asks the people that were sitting, he says, who can bring me the throne of Balqis? And we discussed yesterday, and the Sheikh discussed as well, in the nights prior to that, that the throne of Balqis is looked at at two different perspectives. The first, it's saying that the throne was something that resembles the puppet I'm sitting on, just a throne in which you sit. Other narrations, which are the more famous ones, the throne of Balqis consists of an entire palace with levels, with rooms, with dungeons. And on top of all those levels, there was one particular room which was open towards the sun. And remember, Balqis, the queen, I think they refer to her as a queen of Sheba. Balqis is one of what is one of the people that used to prostrate towards the sun. Well, and they would think or be of the people that think that the sun is their god. So the way it was positioned, this throne, at the top it was open towards the sun. So the sun would come in at all angles. And that's how she had the palace on the top. So when Suleiman says to the people, who can bring me the throne of Balqis? Who can bring me this throne? What did we say? Verse 39 suggests that a jinn stands and he says, I will bring it for you before you stand from your place. Before you stand from your place or where you're sitting, before you stand, I'll bring you the throne. And you will find me for this task Strong and loyal. That's the jinn. Now we won't get into too much detail of what type of jinn he was. That's a totally different aspect altogether that needs a series by itself. What's our jinn? Because they're living with us. There's a narration that says every one person on this earth, there's six jinns. Some narration says there's every particular person on this earth, there's ten jinn. If we have six billion, how many jinn on this earth? Totally different thing we have to look at. Of the utmost importance, but not the topic for tonight. But food for thought. So the jinn says this. Then, verse 40, what does it say? It says, then a person stands and he says, I will bring it for you. He says to Suleiman. I will bring it for you. What did we say yesterday? Before you blink. Before your eyelid touch or goes down. قبل أن يرتد إليك طرفك. Therefore... Let's look at this because people might overlook it. The other side of the world, the other side of the world, in less than a second, less than a second, he brings a palace. Less than a second. Can you imagine blinking and something's right in front of us right now? It's, it's a miracle. The Quran states this. Everyone says without a shadow of doubt this happened because it's mentioned in the Quran. Less than a second, the whole palace is in front of Suleiman. This person, what does the Quran refer to him as? He had knowledge from the book. He had one letter. The Prophet says he has one letter. When he's asked who has knowledge of the, from the book, he says the person that has knowledge from the book is Asif bin Barkhir, which was the wasi of Suleiman. The person that was in charge after Suleiman, the Khalifa after Suleiman, was a Prophet. He's Second in charge was this person that had one letter of Allah's greatest name. That's his capability. Now imagine that the Prophet had 72. What kind of abilities did the Prophet have? Just, I want you just to ponder over it. Look at the miracles in the Quran. Sulaiman, what he could do. Miracles upon miracles upon miracles. Now, in Surah Al-Ra'd, the last verse, which is verse 43, it mentions to the Prophet of Islam, it says to him, he says, and those people that say that you are not a messenger. Look at this verse. It says, and say to those people that say you are not a messenger, 
that it is sufficed that Allah is a witness and the person that has knowledge of the book. Do you see what's happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the Prophet, tell them, tell these people that say you're not a messenger, that it's enough that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a witness that you are a messenger and the person that has knowledge of the book. Not from the book. Of the book. Asif bin Barkhi had from the book. One letter. The complete book was given. Abu Bakr goes towards the Prophet. He says, I want to know. Who is the person that has knowledge from the book? And who is the person that has knowledge of the book? So the Prophet, he says to him. He says, Amma. The person in question that has knowledge from the book. As we stated, it's Asif bin Barkhi. Yes? The wasi of Sulaiman. He says, then who is the person that has knowledge of the book? He says, Amma, the person that has knowledge of the book. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's enough that I am a witness, Allah says. And this person is none other than Ali ibn Abi Talib. Sallu ala Muhammad. Knowledge of the book. So when we come forth and we find, and this, this knowledge is passed down, remember. It's passed down from one imam to another. To safeguard our religion, just as a side note, just as a side note, our religion, if we want to look at perfection, you can look at it in a very in-depth perspective. We can research and research and look at logical perspectives. But I want to give you just a small example that may be able to explain to people that think that the Prophet isn't infallible because there's many religions that come forth or many schools of thought which is outside the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt, which say that the Prophet is fallible. He may be infallible in an aspect of Sharia law, but everything else is fallible. He makes mistakes like normal human beings. The Quran says, The Quran says he does not act of his own accord. He does not say something from his own accord. Everything he says and he utters is from Allah. Quran. You want to go against Quran? If the Quran is perfect, is there anyone in any sect of Islam that disagrees that the Qur'an is perfect? Everyone agrees that the Qur'an is made in so much perfection that up from now, from the start of time, from when the Qur'an is revealed, till the Imam Allah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif comes, you won't be able to analyze the depth. The more science develops, the more it becomes what? Intertwined. Wa alaykum salam wa It becomes more intertwined. Everything starts to become in more and more sense. And we begin to realize who these people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted goes hand in hand with the Quran because you need people of perfection to give you the correct aspect of the Quran. I'll give you one example and moving on to the side notes. Two, two women come, they gave birth to the same, at the same time. One gave birth to a male and the other gave birth to a female. Same husband. They came towards Ali ibn Abi Talib. At the end, after the massive calamities happened and people are like, because the woman wanted the boy. They both claimed that the boy is theirs. But they gave birth at the same time. How are they going to differentiate? Which mother had the boy? Which mother had the girl? So they go around. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, I need the milk from both mothers. It's interesting, isn't it? Ali ibn Abi Talib says, give me the milk from both mothers in the same cup. So he weighs them. Strange. And you think to yourself, what's, what's going on? But Ali had knowledge from the Quran. He is able to dissect the Quran. He is able to look at the metaphorical aspects, the inner beauty, the inner truth of the Quran. What does he say? He weighs them. And the people find that one cup of milk weighs twice as much as the other. Why? What's going on? He says, the milk that weighs twice as much, that mother is the mother of the boy. How? How did you come to that conclusion, O Ali ibn Abi Talib? He says, in the Quran it states, the right of the male is like twice of that of the female. لِلذَّكَرْ مِثْلَلْ For the male, it's as if 
for the two females. It says, therefore, I've dissected that the milk will be twice as heavy. That verse was referring to inheritance. Ali ibn Talib dissects it and he says, what? No, this is also referring to other particular issues. Who will find that? We need someone that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala injects knowledge into, reveals knowledge into to dissect this. That's a side note. So if we have, in any logical perspective, if Allah is perfect and everyone agrees, at least the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt agrees that Allah is perfect and untangible. He can't be objectified. He can't be seen. That's the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt. That's Tawheed. Allah is perfect. The Quran is perfect. 100%. Everyone agrees. Now, the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt says that the Prophet of Islam, which is the mediator between the two, is perfect. Yes? Other schools of thought say, no, he's not a perfect character in every aspect. Doesn't that leave a question? Doesn't it leave a question if Allah is perfect, the Quran is perfect, but the person that's a mediator isn't perfect, doesn't make him a hypocrite? If he says, do this, do this, do this as the Quran, and he doesn't do it, does it make him perfect? Is he revealing the correct message? Of course not. It becomes, and so many contradictions fall into it. There, therefore, the only logical perspective and the perspective of the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt is if Allah is perfect, the Quran is perfect, the mediator, without a shadow of doubt, that is the link between perfection and perfection has to be perfect. Has to be infallible. Can't have any mistakes. Otherwise, if he says something and he doesn't do it, he becomes a hypocrite. Doesn't it? He becomes a hypocrite. That's why the school of, the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt is infallible. The imams that carry on the message and protect the message are infallible. It's not that they can't sin. They can sin. They're normal human beings. But they choose not to sin. Any normal person has the choice. What do you think about the person that's elevated in ranks? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more elevated they are, the more they give them. The more they give them. You take one step towards Allah, Allah comes ten steps towards you. What do you say about that? These people have quenched have been quenched with the ma'rifah of Allah have been quenched with the closeness towards Allah these people are not like us when I go towards my salah I can't wait and inshallah tomorrow we're going to be talking about the essence of salah when I go towards salah I'm thinking when am I going to finish and I'm happy I smile I'm finished salah now I can go do my normal activities these imams they would cry when salah would finish because they think I have to wait till the next salah until I can go towards a connection with my Lord. That's the difference. Perfection and perfection. That's why we strive to be like them. That's the side note. Now going back into the main aspect, the power that's given to these people, the responsibility given towards Ali ibn Abi Talib in, in these nights that we discuss. Obviously, the Prophet of Islam is first and foremost. Then the person that's his reflection is Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then we have the Imams that follow on after them. Until Imam Sahib al Asri was Zaman. But why do we find it hard in the Quran when we find these miracles? When we have, as an example, I'll give you an example of a miracle. And this one's one of the ones that's been ticked in history, that's been narrated. Imam Rada, Imam Ali Rada, alayhi afdal salati wa salam. It's narrated in the court of. The Ma'amun, he's invited. And there's a magician there. Look at this narration. And tell me if you find it strange, if you want to compare it with bringing a palace in a split second. Imam Rada standing there. Remember, what does Imam Hussein say? He says, we will not be humiliated. Hayhat minnal We will not be humiliated. When he says, I've been put into a comparison. I have to choose one of two. Either death, or humiliation, I choose death because no way will we be humiliated. We will not be humiliated. Imam Rada comes into the courtroom. There was a magician there. Imam Rada goes to pick up a bread. The magician he thinks he's playing around with a normal person. He moves the bread up to the Imam. As he goes to take it, the bread's up. The Imam looks at him. He goes again, the, the bread's up, he wants to hold it, he brings it back down. The imam warns him. He says, you don't want to do that again. 
Because we don't like to be humiliated. We will not be humiliated. Al-Ma'mun, people in the palace, they're laughing. Imam's patient. He says, don't do it again. He's warned him. So he goes again to take that bread. The magician thinks it's funny again. He puts the bread up. Ali ibn Musa, there was a painting behind this man. Some people might have come across this narration. There was a painting of a lion behind that man. He looks at the painting. He just looks at it. The narration says the painting comes to life. The lion jumps out of the picture. It says, Ma'mun faints. The Ma'mun faints. He says, all that was left of that magician was his bones. Now, there's, there's, a, there's a strength of how it's narrated that it's saying in the Arabic terminology that not only did he devour this magician, he sucked the blood from his bones to give you a more in-depth analogy of what's happened to this man. And the lion goes back into the painting. And then he goes to the Ma'mun after he wakes up. Ma'mun looks at him and says, did that just happen? Imam smiles. He says, we'll not be humiliated. And he walks out. People might find that hard to believe. People may come forward and say, well, it's a miracle, but it's, it's hard to comprehend. What are we given? What, honestly, if we think to ourselves, if we look at Suleiman, so the Wasi of Suleiman had one letter. I'm telling you, these people had more than one. You think if he, can't, he can bring something from another place on earth in a split second, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't allow him for a painting to come to life. Isa had two letters, two letters. He had a sculpture. In the Quran it narrates, he makes a sculpture out of clay. Doesn't have any life. The Quran, what does it say? It says, بِإِذْنِ He blows on it, it becomes a dove. Clay. Picture becomes a lion. Clay, the Quran says, it, he blew on it. It says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted and it becomes. Blows on it. Makes a clay sculpture, blows on it, becomes a dove. You think it's hard? That a lion comes out of a painting. And we look at Ali ibn Abi Talib, miracles upon miracles. I can't state them. That I'm afraid to state them on the pulpit. And it's a shame because we know the position. People here, everyone I know, knows the position of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Knows what he's capable of. Knows that Allah has instilled in him. There's narrations that honestly... You'll look at them and you're like, I don't know how to explain this. I was reading today. I, I'm questioning myself if I should narrate this or not. But I'll narrate it nonetheless. If you want the, the masdar, I'll have it with me. In the book of Ma'ajiz Ali ibn Abi Talib, or Ma'ajiz Imam Ali, he narrates, I think it's the 23rd or the 33rd miracle that he narrates in a book of 2,400 miracles of Ali ibn Abi Talib in reference to a jinn. And I want you just to comprehend it because we have in our narrations that Ali ibn Abi Talib was given the rank of Amir al-Mu'mineen when Adam was between clay and water. And everyone agrees to this. But do we comprehend it? Do we understand it? Do we, do we ponder over it? We don't. How is it that Ali ibn Abi Talib back then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed it to be? How is it back then? Now this narration goes as follows, and inshallah tomorrow we'll continue with the bravery of Ali ibn Abi Talib and inshallah salah, to look at what made him a great man and how we can achieve through something as simple as salah, we can be great, we can be grand. We may overlook it, but it has one of the most important, pivotal positions as the followers of Ahlul Bayt, salah, salah, salah. I'm going to narrate this and I'll let you ponder over it. And there's so many like it. The narration states, I need you to focus with me. And I'm, I'm mentioning this narration from the book. I'm translating it to Arabic book, I'm translating it to English. The Prophet of Islam was sitting next to a jinn. We all know jinn exists. We can't say jinn doesn't exist. He was sitting next to a jinn. Ali ibn Abi Talib walks in. The jinn becomes smaller and smaller and smaller until it becomes a bird. Ali ibn Talib comes in, he talks with the Prophet of Islam, then he leaves. As he leaves, the jinn resumes his form. Back to his aura, his strength. 
Then the Prophet looks at him. He has a smile on his face. He says, what's happened? He says, I know that person. Who is he? So the Prophet begins, and he says, this is my cousin. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib. What do you know of him? He says that we've met before. He says, I don't differentiate. I can't mistake that face. He says, what do you mean you've met him before? Jinns live for thousands of years. What do you mean you met him before? He's a young man. He says, I was one of the jinn at the time of Nabi Allah, Nuh. When the ark was being built, I went to demolish that ark. Ali, Nabi Allah, Nuh, what doesn't make sense. He says, I want to demolish that ark. He says, then, what does Ali come into the picture? He says, by God, that face is unmistakable. I went to break the ark or destroy the ark with a group of the jinn with me. He says, that person's face came towards me. He cut off my arm. From that day, I remember his face. And he says, I revealed my arm. He says, the jinn says, I, he, the, the prophet says, he revealed his arm and it was cut. He says, that's the person that cut my arm. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's, that's the smallest one. I don't want to get into too much detail into the other jinn stories. But just ponder over it. I just want you to ponder over it. If anyone wants the reference, I'll give you the references. But inshallah, we end on this manner because I've taken much of your time and the sheikh is waiting for me. My apologies. And inshallah, we'll resume tomorrow by talking about salah. But on this note, we'd like to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in knowledge, increase us in ma'rifah, Increase us in love and allow us to be firm on the message of Islam. Allow us to be firm on the love of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.